Welcome and thank you for joining us today for Redefining Automation Horizons, Orchestrating Multi-Cloud Landscapes. My name is Raleigh Gould and I'll be moderating today's event. Our featured speakers are Dan Twing, President and COO at EMA, Alexandra Thurow, Associate Vice President of Product Management at HCL Software, and Eugene Vion, Partner Solutions Architect at Amazon Web Services. Dan joined DMA in 2005 and has over 25 years of experience in information systems, software development, and technology outsourcing. Dan focuses on all aspects of intelligent and automated management of IT. Alexandra joined HCL in 2016 after 20 years in IBM, working in services, software development, support, and product management. In her role as Associate Vice President, she is responsible for product strategy and offering management for automation, DevOps, and mainframe software. Having spent over eight years across multiple teams at AWS, Eugene's primary focus has been supporting AWS customers and partners. He is recognized as a public speaker and writer, having written a number of public blogs and presented sessions at various AWS conferences, including AWS reInvent. And now I'd like to go ahead and turn things over to our first featured speaker, Dan Twing. Dan? Thanks, Raleigh. Well, as we talk about orchestration, um, I thought I'd start by talking about the difference between automation and orchestration. It's a subtle difference, and a lot of the workload tools have had some orchestration capabilities in them really from the beginning, but this aspect has really been ramping up as we try to push for more automation and more digital transformation. Uh, so when we're, when we're speaking about automation, we're, we're talking pretty much about a, a single task that gets automated. You're really focusing on streamlining this routine, repetitive kind of task. Um, it's, it's repetitive and it's rule-based. And the big difference when you start to think about orchestration is that you're bringing in decision-making and logic to the process. You're, you're potentially altering the outcome. So automation, pretty straightforward. If then else, do this, do that. Orchestration, be aware and make some decisions along the way. Um, and so as automation becomes more complex, we really have a need to go beyond just pure automation and begin to uh, focus more on the orchestration aspects. When we bring that to workload automation and workflow orchestration, um, the workload automation, you know, it has focused on this, uh, you know, you define a job, the job does what it's going to do. That's pretty task focused. And there are some decision making that we've had along the way with some basic auto, uh, you know, auto remediation kinds of capabilities. But when we really start to orchestrate the workflows, we're spanning systems, we're spanning a much bigger arc, uh, and we're making choices along the way. And, and that really is the biggest distinction there. Um, and of course, as we bring AI more into the focus here and into the, into the products, that ability to make those decisions is going to become uh, much greater. One aspect of uh, orchestration is that we get uh, kind of as a byproduct almost, we get more observability if it's done right. Um, and, you know, the workload tools, of course, have always been focused on SLA policy awareness. Um, so that's a good outcome, although uh, I have noticed in, in my research recently that we do see um, a significant increase in the number of jobs as we're as we're orchestrating more things, uh, and especially as we get into the multi-cloud environment, there's there's just a lot more infrastructure work to do. We get all that flexibility; that's great. We have to do more to care and feed for it um, along the way, and so jobs are going up with a lot of new use cases. Jobs are going up in supporting the new infrastructure. Um, you increase the volume, uh, you do see uh, an increase in failure rates and a few more SLAs that are being missed because, you know, as we learn to orchestrate, we have to learn how to do this, do this better. Uh, the earlier new applications and digital processes get orchestrated by WA, the sooner it can actually, you know, begin to help the process. Um, and it is touching a lot of the business. Uh, this is some data that I've collected uh, twice now and, uh, it's a different look at workload. I, you know, jump all the way to the end and say uh, three different questions. What, you know, which groups of the business are uh, leaning he most heavily on workload automation? Uh, finance, we all know finance closes a big use case. 
not surprising to see them at the top of the list, but you see sales and service and supply chain and human resources, you know, all of the different business outcomes are really touched by this tool. And when we look at who's using these tools daily or multiple times a week for the self-service capabilities uh, to get dashboards and other information about the out business outcomes they care about, you can see that that you, you have uh, every part of the business touching this tool and coming up with new uh, things that they'd like to have automated. Um, so it's already a key part of delivering for all of these businesses. And, and what we're talking about with the orchestration and bringing AI into the mix is that we're, we're really improving our abilities uh, to manage that. A big part of the change is as we're looking at digital transformation, it's really closely intertwined with the broader enter enterprise automation uh, so, you know, when we look at digital transformation, uh, just so we're all on the same page, we're really looking at leveraging these digital technologies to fundamentally change and improve business operations, customer experiences, and even the whole business model, as we've all seen happen. Uh, a lot of that leans heavily on cloud computing, and that serves as sort of a foundational element for many of the digital transformation processes. Uh, this creates you know, new infrastructure, new resources, new services, all of which have to be orchestrated and monitored along the way. And that's putting a lot of pressure on the old mainframe systems. And we're seeing a lot of activity around mainframe modernization. Uh, really to bring it current, uh, that can take many different forms, rehosting, refactoring, um, replatforming and, and re-architecting are a couple of different uh, ways. You either rewrite the code in a modern way in place, or you Simulate the mainframe in a cloud is really what those two kind of end up being, but we need to modernize those applications so that they can be interacted with and orchestrated like we're doing uh, many of the other newer built, you know, born in the cloud kinds of things. Automation really helps enterprises adapt. Um, and what we're seeing is that about 97% of enterprises have some form of digital transformation underway. Um, most of them are in the middle of that process. About 15, 18% have kind of reached maturity and are assessing, you know, what might come next. But the bulk of the market is right in the middle of dealing with this and learning to orchestrate it as they go along. And workload automation does a lot of things in and around uh, digital transformation. Um, the, the biggest thing is automating the DevOps processes really speeds up the development. And as we've moved more to uh, that CI, CD mentality of, of, you know, constant and continuous improvements and changes, uh, automating that is, is very important. The other area that has really stepped up is, is the infrastructure configuration as we've had more software defined components, software defined networking, software defined storage and serverless computing. It's changed the way that we interact with the infrastructure. Um, so workload has, is playing a very big role. In fact, um, it isn't on this slide, but about 12% of jobs are what people uh, in the space who, who work with these tools would classify as traditional work. And between cloud config and on-premises uh, infrastructure configuration, that's about 12% of activity now as well. So that is becoming a big use case here. But, and then WA often plays a big role in moving files where they need to be and getting the data in the right place. Um, and then, it, you know, some folks are using it to connect different kinds of digital transformation. Uh, one example uh, that I've used is, uh, you know, you might have um, a new inventory process stood up and then separately you might have an, a dashboard for executives and that dashboard getting its inventory data and connecting two different digital processes Workload may play a role in that. And if you have on that dashboard, the ability to request a refresh of certain data, workload may take an action based on that. So it's it's in the middle helping uh, as digital transformation comes forward. And then to look at the cloud, workload and cloud have a very interesting relationship. Um, it, 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 I kind of break it out like this. First of all, as we just talked about, WLA is supporting the cloud infrastructure. It, all of the tools that can spin up and change resources and adapt and dynamically uh, adjust along the way, workload is in the mix, um, actually you know, coordinating and orchestrating those actions. So it can build the infrastructure in an automated fashion from the beginning, 
and then repeat that as we move through test and into production and then monitor and adjust the infrastructure for performance along the way. Uh, it also supports cloud-based applications. Um, it's doing a lot of things in the background instead of a one giant batch job doing reports as we used to see, you're seeing a lot of support for online applications. Many times these can be three and four pieces that need to be coordinated, uh, files fill up, resource changes uh, based on volume and whatnot is all of the, the domain of workload automation. And as we're bringing more legacy workloads into the cloud, there's a big role for workload as well. Um, whether we're modernizing those mainframes, whether we're, we're re replatforming them, uh, workload is involved in that. But then you can host your workload in the cloud. So besides run, you know, we're configuring the infrastructure, we're running jobs in the cloud, we can host it in the cloud. And, and many of the tools are now available in the Amazon marketplaces. Um, and then of course, there are SaaS options, which are hosted in the cloud and operated by somebody else. And, and that uh, is becoming more and more popular. So um, just a quick uh, look at some data points on cloud. You know, there's a lot of cloud services that get used both to support uh, productivity use of uh, staff and, you know, like the office productivity suite or CRM type tools. Um, and then of course we're consuming a lot of, a lot of cloud and communications and data uh, services, a lot of compute in the cloud. Um, a lot of the ERP stuff is in the cloud now. Um, a big change is, you know, uh, SAP, um, S4 and HANA is pushing a lot of that into the cloud. So as those services come along, workload plays a big role in supporting a lot of those services. Um, you can see that the, uh, the one that, uh, these are sort of in um, order of importance. And we ask, you know, is workload providing extensive support, moderate support, minimal support, or it's not really supporting uh, these services at all. And you can see in most organizations, um, Cloud storage uh, is a big one that, that workload is involved in. Uh, the blue bar being the extensive support, the green bar being moderate, um, and you know around data and data services, around ERP, CRM, compute, the productivity suites, communication, all across the board, workload is involved in, in supporting those services. Um, when you get into multi-cloud, you end up with a lot of infrastructure to care for, um, and again, um, when we ask, you know, how important are each of the following workload cloud use cases to your cloud operations, the infrastructure automation, most important part. Hybrid cloud data transfer, uh, you start having more environments, you got to get the data in and amongst and between them along the way. Um, as things are migrated around the cloud, workload is, is a big part of that. Orchestration and observability. Um, and then just, again, the 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 multi-cloud transfer. So you, you got data between the on-prem and the cloud, and you also got data moving between clouds. So workload actually picked up a lot more work to support this highly flexible cloud environment. It's a great environment for our compute and whatnot, and it, it allows all the digital transformation, but it needs a lot of care and feeding as well. And then in terms of workloads in the cloud, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but you can see you know, the reasons that people do it. Uh, scalability, reliability, and provisioning speed are really the top of that list. It just, it, it just is the right place to run this stuff, but you do need the tool to help you automate doing so. So we talked a bit there about just this, this getting data in the right place. And this is becoming a big, big use case for workload as well. And it's a key part of, of what happens with orchestration is just making sure data is where it is, when it needs to be there. Um, we have so many different sources now. You've got, you've got edge computing and IoT devices generating data. You've got all these different cloud tools. Getting all of that into the right place at the right time, uh, it's a relatively simple concept. It just takes a lot of coordination and planning and the orchestration to make sure that it's all happening on time and within the SLA requirements. Um, using WLA orchestration absolutely will speed the development of these data pipelines and the management of them. Finally, looking at the impact of, of AI on workload. Um, this is uh, a concept that um, 
Alexandra is going to give us a, a good uh, demonstration of some of the things that they're doing. Um, they're they're one of the ones out front on this concept, but uh, you know we're all expecting Gen AI to impact a lot of different tools. In, in specifically with workload automation, uh, it's going to do a lot to enhance the user interface and in the way you interact and engage with the tool and bring more intelligence to things like the decisions that the tool is making around dynamic resource allocation or um, identifying anomalies or abnormalities in, in the workload behavior. Um, by the way, this image on the side here was created by Dali. I said, you know, what what will workload look like with uh, AI brought uh, to you know to bear on on the problem, and and this image is what what it came up with, which I thought was a pretty good reflection of, you know, it, the the back end processes don't have to change that much, but how you interact with the tool and how the tool can uh, make decisions along the way uh, is, is going to shift how we use it. So um, the status of AI currently in workload automation, um, we see broad use of machine learning and other things in the predictive analytics capabilities that a lot of the tools have. That was really, it's been going on for a number of years, um, really seen minimal support of AI-based functions within the tools. Um, full function APIs do exist, you know, front end, most of the modern workload tools have every capability in their UI in their API and even capabilities that don't exist in the UI in the API. So it's really ready to receive the assistance from these AI tools um, and that's coming along. And, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see uh, what Alexandra is going to show us. Um, Real quick from, from the most recent radar report that I did uh, looking at all the tools in this space, the, um, AI and knowledge-based tools for some of the administrative functions around anomaly detection, some of the things in predictive analytics is where we really have capability. So 73% of the products have this anomaly detection in some form, about 46%, 47% have um, AI powered anomaly de detection with alerting. Um, so we're seeing you know, some of these capabilities show up um, across all seven of those cap functions, only 13% um, of the products support all of that. Another 13% support um, six of those seven functions. And you can kind of see how that breaks out. And almost 30% of the products in the market aren't really addressing this at all. They're you know, tools that probably won't make this journey. When we look at the AI-based features in workload automation products, um, more specifically, um, using uh, an uh, anomaly detection in, in and front ending uh, with the predictive scheduling, assisting operators. You can see that these capabilities are supported in a handful of products. Um, really, uh, there's just uh, about six, 7% of the market that's doing all four of those functions. Um, and and uh, the uh, the HCL workload automation is, is one of those that uh, is pushing the edge on, on these AI capabilities. And so with that, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Alexandra, who's gonna talk a bit more about what HCL has been doing and actually show us some of this AI stuff in, in use. Thank you, Dan. Thank you also for all these key insights uh, on the workload automation threats that comes from your research. And I did, I'd like to start with uh, the role and potential of AI and see what we're doing in HCL software. So if you go in the next chart, uh, the, the first element uh, really that uh, we started to look at uh, some, uh, some years ago were uh, obviously uh, the type of technologies and the type of users that were ready also to adopt to experiment AI, because we're seeing that also with Gen AI today. Everyone talks about Gen AI, but applying Gen AI really without the risk of uh, hallucinations uh, or things. I mean, you can't just apply AI in your technology. It needs to be applied to specific use cases and, and validated with, uh, with customers. So uh, some key elements we've been looking at were uh, injecting AI where it can support uh, the operations uh, where it can support the business users, so the democratization of the access to automation. Uh, so here in particular with this uh, second point, uh, the NLP and the introduction of for virtual assistant Clara, I will show you some uh, a bit of uh, video 
uh, have been, um, I think, uh, a, a big element that have the, uh, changed the way our customers are experimenting workload automation internally. Next to come, Gen AI. Uh, this is uh, going to help really with the, as an extension of the human intelligence. So yes, natural language for us is a new UI. And this is how Clara uh, or um, a virtual assistant uh, help to support, um, let's say the, the first element, it will help to answer questions, right? To, to help uh, with the, the enablement, the onboarding on our customers. Uh, helping uh, new users that comes to automation also in understanding uh, the, the power of workload automation for them. And it will help also, I mean, going beyond just answering questions, really helping to take actions, to, to recommend actions and activities, self-service um, uh, type of automation for also business users. So that helps to have more employee autonomy, more maturity, and the next level of um, as a natural language will be uh, coming with our, our next release uh, later this uh, this summer with the first introduction of some Gen AI scenarios to be able to create uh, workflows through Gen AI and with obviously our assistance and AI assistant. A second scenario here, if you see on the right, AIDA uh, or AI Data Advisor. Uh, this solution here is targeted for operator. So our objective here were to understand how we could add intelligence uh, and machine learning patterns to understand early the workload anomalies. So with all the historical data that we have in our system, how can we help operators understand where they are risk of problems before they happen? Because it's easy, let's say, to create a, a ticket, an alert, against the problem that is happening, that has happened. It's more difficult, obviously, to be able to predict uh, issues. So this is where our solutions help uh, with this uh, swim line to, to analyze where there is a risk of uh, different behavior in the system than uh, um, in the, the past historical execution. So if we go to the next uh, chart, um, thank you, as before. Sorry, yeah. just one. Yeah. Yes. So who's using the virtual assistant? So some uh, uh, an example here uh, coming from uh, um, an American customer, uh, MFS. Um, MFS just presented uh, with us in a, in a conference last week, uh, also more uh, broadly this experience. They've been using uh, Clara uh, with um, their group, within the group for different population in their uh, automation, uh, um, it says, center, um, yeah, automation center. So first, uh, they will leverage Clara for the automation experts. So for the staff who's managing the workload, for the people really looking at monitoring, troubleshooting the system, where Clara can help doing a first level of troubleshooting. So uh, getting uh, the, um, uh, giving some more details about uh, the, the context of the error, helping to capture the job log directly, uh, rerunning a job, taking some simple actions will not solve the problem, solve all problems, but it helps uh, certainly to accelerate the troubleshooting for the operations. And obviously the, the other target uh, population that is very important are the business users, the business technologies, how to make them more autonomous so they don't have to become a, a product expert learning all the uh, detailed powerful capabilities of the uh, or automation orchestration uh, uh, products, but really being able to simply request uh, some specific by transfer, kicking off uh, the the reporting um, uh, workflow for uh, uh, or making changes in uh, into the system with uh, submitting some requests to uh, the um, operations and uh, automation staff. So this is um, this is. Uh, a solution that uh, works again for uh, different type of users. Let's go on next. Um, I'd like to talk about another another topic. Uh, I mean, Dan, you've been mentioning also the importance of uh, workload automation for uh, an expansion uh, type of use cases uh, because the the challenge uh, that uh, uh, customers are facing today is uh, really 
to be able to apply, I think, uh, orchestration to a broader set of uh, automations, removing islands of automation, being able to uh, acquire in some areas some unstructured data rather than uh, on the other side, be able to include also what we call the human in the loop. So people to validate, uh, to, to do revision of the execution of the workload so that the end-to-end -end process can be uh, always more under the control of uh, those uh, SLAs and avoid uh, delays. So an example I'm bringing here, um, and you will see still, so Clara, who uh, have some emotions, right? So sometimes Clara is uh, uh, red if there is a problem, uh, green or blue if uh, things are proceeding uh, well. Uh, so we'll see also how Clara uh, helps in, uh, in such a, uh, uh, data pipeline orchestration story. So in an insurance company that's uh, uh, providing a new mobile app for the claiming reimbursements, uh, there is a need of uh, uh, a workflow that can take into account very different type of, uh, of task or jobs uh, and the human in the loop. If we go next, we'll see the solution uh, implemented. So Clara will help with uh, the access to the service, obviously, right? This is the solution that helps uh, uh, maybe the business technologist uh, and uh, the automation staff uh, understanding how to apply well um, or technology for a specific uh, use case. And uh, the or solution um, or platform which integrates with a uh, hundred of uh, different technologies, sorry, uh, will help really to orchestrate that process, uh, starting in this example here from capturing um, files from uh, uh, from the uh, capturing files, files and storage. In, sorry, I'm mixing my words. So capturing the files and providing them into uh, AWS uh, S3 storage, for example. Uh, being able to trigger uh, OCR recognition with uh, solutions like MyBarrels or AWS Textract. Uh, all those integrations, um, obviously, the, the value of the, the technology that we offer is to provide a low-code approach to do the modeling of this workflow. So it's not that workflow, you don't need to script it, you don't need to develop APIs or connect APIs together. This is really a um, type of a wizard. Uh, approach that will help to build that uh, that workflow uh, and consequences um, the the results the the control over all the execution of that uh, process. Um, a few other steps here. You see uh, the AI analysis uh, performed by OpenAI by providing also integration with uh, OpenAI ChatGPT. We enable also the customers to consider AI not only as a, uh, an enabler of uh, a democratization of the access of automation, but also at uh, improving internally their processes and still being part of that uh, workload uh, automation um, overall story. The human approval, as I was mentioning, including the possibility to capture that uh, um, insurance expert revision and validation. This is important because not everything can be automated 100%. We need to have, obviously, uh, the company expert to be part of the processes. So the more they are including into that overall automation, the, the better for the uh, overall SLA achievements of the, of the process that is visible to the end user. Uh, integration with JIRA, ServiceNow, these are fundamental to be able to integrate with alerting with uh, an observable um, uh, process that uh, can have an overall control from uh, the IT operation teams. So that results in saving on the manual efforts. This results in a very important improvement in time to market because you really uh, automate the full process and very different nature of jobs. Let's go next. A third topic I wanted to mention, and Dan was uh, talking about the complexity of the re relationship between uh, workload automation technologies and cloud. And in, indeed, they are very different aspects to consider 
for a workload automation technology to be able to support the cloud transformation of the customers. Because customers will we see uh, may have uh, challenges or opportunities to uh, say to decommission the mainframe or to make the mainframe relevant into the digital transformation initiatives. So connecting the mainframe workload into the the hybrid uh, architecture and. Uh, and, and so all the processes. There will be application refactoring. Uh, we want also to have, customers want also to have more and more uh, their workload automation uh, technologies moving where the workloads are moving. So moving to Kubernetes platform, uh, adopting the cloud native pattern. So solutions available in microservices, uh, active, active, uh, uh, auto scalable so that they, they can really follow the new standards of the cloud native. And in that example, I wanted to highlight um, a recent case study from a, a customer who was looking at decommissioning the mainframe and rebuilding their application as a cloud native application. So they, um, they had uh, we, we have migrated the, the workloads that were managed uh, since now in um, Broadcom CS7 to our solution deploy in the cloud, because as I mentioned, everything is moving to the cloud. So you need a solution that run on the clouds and for the clouds. So these two dimensions are very important. The, the jobs have been um, completely migrated with no disruption. The benefit of our platform is also to uh, offer not only let's say the traditional workload scheduling but also capabilities such as uh, integrating managed file transfer so with that uh, transformation we were able also to replace other solutions uh, like Robo and Stone Branch file transfer with the uh, with our solution and so to enable uh, also new automation scenarios because with these new cloud native applications there comes um, new automation requirements, so the requirements to integrate with cloud services, the requirements to integrate with the, really, as the, uh, Dan was mentioning, the control on where the data, where the workloads need to run and when it needs to run. So you need an automation tools to, to do this, an automation tool integrated with the cloud standards. Last point, uh, I mentioned AIDA before. So the AI data advisor, this is uh, also where uh, such customers are moving from, let's say the, the mainframe practice of doing workload automation to the new way, cloud and AI way of doing workload automation. Uh, and really, so workload automation orchestration, that's a jump uh, where AI can help really to um, not only handle more use cases, uh, simplified architecture because everything is consolidated under one strategic tool, but also leveraging AI to improve uh, the operations. Let's go to the next chart. So talking about uh, the importance of uh, the integration of uh, uh, legacy on-premises words and cloud and multi-cloud words. Uh, so our, our solution runs on, on any clouds and runs uh, so on premises, runs uh, on traditional architecture or on, uh, on, on Kubernetes uh, microservices type of architectures. Um, what is important for us is obviously to have a solution that integrates with uh, any, uh, any vendor and uh, uh, any the most applications as possible so that we help customers doing that uh, local no code integration of their processes. But we have also developed a, a strong partnership with AWS because we see AWS as a, a perfect partner for us to look at the, the different layers of that uh, cloud and workload automation relationship. So being able to orchestrate the cloud workloads be able to integrate with uh, the, the cloud services architecture. So that means integrating with Lambda, with Step Function, integrated uh, with the, the cloud events uh, in AWS. So that we provide an advantage. Integrated with, the, with the, the cloud API so that we can help not only uh, so specific deep integration with SAP. So we are certified in SAP. We support a lot of people, soft, uh, informatic, uh, different uh, 
RFPA tools uh, also, but it's important anyway to be able to orchestrate any type of APIs. So REST APIs type of orchestration is a very important scenario for us. But again, talking back about uh, AWS, uh, we'll have a gene uh, bringing us more into the details of our partnership and some uh, insights on uh, the AWS marketplace reports. Jean, over to you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, really, really exciting stuff being done by, uh, you know, HCL workload automation. Um, and it's a topic that I'm really kind of passionate about, uh, automation specifically. Uh, as Raleigh mentioned at the beginning, you know, I've been at AWS just over eight years now and literally helped hundreds of customers either migrate to the cloud, um, optimize workloads in the cloud, or, you know, really build new SaaS-based applications. And you know, I've seen firsthand how critical automation and more more importantly, the right automation is. And also, you know, there's kind of various kinds of automation. Uh, I'll probably lean more to the technical pieces uh, and also kind of the, the EQ side of, of automation as well. Um, but, the, you know, really kind of this, this would apply to all forms of automation here. So next slide, please, Dan. So I will be talking about, you know, a couple of data points that speak to, you know, kind of the, the criticality of automation, um, the broad access we have to it, uh, you know, today uh, compared to the compared to the past, um, the impact of automation on employees, and then also um, cover how AWS and HCL software are partnering to make this easier for customers. So as we move into the next slide here, um, I'll start with a quote from our CTO, uh, Werner Vogels. He had this kind of famous quote at a reInvent conference about everything fails all the time. And since then, it's stuck with a, a lot of people for, for many reasons. Uh, and I think that's firstly because it's very, very true. Uh, everything does fail all the time. Um, we don't seem to notice these days as much, but uh, it absolutely happens. Um, and it's also kind of stuck because it reminds us that we we can't be in control of every single part of an environment, right? And so therefore, the statement kind of applies when thinking about automation too. And I'll kind of get back to this quote a little bit later. Um, so to get us going in the next slide here, um, it's really important to learn from high-performing teams. So working with customers, we consistently see high-performing teams placing you know, a real relentless focus on automation. And as seen from the data here, automation really leads to uh, three primary things, which is faster deployment times, at least from a technical you know, kind of perspective, uh, lower change failure rates, and also a lower mean time to resolution when things inevitably do go wrong. And as we heard from that quote, you know, it, it is kind of inevitable for, for things to go wrong. And so uh, in fact, over 50% of SMBs uh, say that automation allowed their business to quickly pivot as a result of the pandemic. And so it really shows that the right automation absolutely helps when planning fails. Um, however, uh, it's clear that across you know, customers, we're not sufficiently automated. Uh, next slide, please, Dan. And so the, the right automation is not often easy to achieve. And that's kind of shown in the numbers here, right? So over 90% of US knowledge workers spend a portion of their day on repetitive and time consuming work. And this expands to critical roles like developers where over 80% of developer, developer time uh, is spent in operations and maintenance. And so this comes at a, at a huge cost to businesses, you know, paying kind of expensive resources to spend time away from their core competencies and up to 80% time away. So that's a a pretty large, uh, pretty large number there. And as we move into the next slide here, we'll see that um, you know the good news is automation is now more accessible than it ever has been, right? And so um, that's true not just for large enterprises, but for businesses of all sizes. Um, you know, we see workloads are more API driven today than it's ever been in the past, and due to this, automation is easier to implement across a wide array of environments. We see this both for complex and routine um, you know, applications and tasks. So repeatable automation is possible for things like software delivery, of course, uh, you know, kind of kind of on the complex side, uh, but also for the for the routine side, you know, um, manual tasks like routine admin work and those kind of things 
um, you know, having kind of workflows and, and automation there is, is important. And, and this expands, you know, quite a bit. Uh, as we move into the next slide here, um, you'll see another trend that's helping uh, with automating complex workloads, and that's moving to infrastructure as code. And so more and more businesses are adopting IAC, uh, and this means that even the largest and most complicated applications can have automation workflows added to them. And so customers kind of keep trending towards this world where the majority of environments are written as code. And in these environments, it's possible to have real high levels of automation um, and visibility into the into the environment, which kind of helps with the, the automation piece. But this is really where the right automation tools become really important, right? Uh, you don't really want to hire entire teams focusing on building automation tools. Um, you want the, those teams to, you know, develop and, and build automation um, that run on on top of the the, the right tooling there. And so, uh, moving to the next slide. In automation tools, we see that reaction time is really critical and, and important to customers, right? And so it's important for these automation tools to meet the services hosting and orchestrating workloads where they're at. Uh, and some examples here are having automation products integrate with the right APIs. You know, that's critically important. But also having these automation tools be event-driven architectures kind of themselves, right? Kind of adopting those those best practices. And then also when it makes sense for these tools to integrate with native services at the destinations that they're trying to automate rather than adding you know, additional complexities for customers. And I think a great example here is uh, the workload automation tool integrating with AWS Step Functions. So Step Functions is a service, um, an AWS service that helps orchestrate workflows. And HWA decided to integrate here to provide customers with more flexibility uh, of using, you know, kind of those built-in AWS integrations, you know, where the workloads run. And so this really simplifies things for customers and allows more to be managed within the HWA tool itself. Um, you know, and there's kind of a lot of benefits there for customers. And so as we move into the next slide, um, we also want to look at how automation impacts employees, right? And this is kind of less, less talked about. Uh, so kind of on the EQ side of things, automation often improves more than just, you know, downtime and steep speed of recovery and those kind of things. Um, it often leads to increased, you know, job satisfaction and a work, better work-life balance for employees. And the truth is no one likes to do, you know, kind of the tedious tasks that uh, we're all now and then, uh, now and again required to do. I'm sure everybody on the call here um, has done something this week that they wish had been automated out, out of their lives. Uh, I know I definitely have. Um, and as seen on the slide here, the majority of employees report that automation increases productivity and gives them time to focus on, you know, more on customers, um, take on new challenging projects and, you know, do things like learn new skills. And so on top of that, for kind of technical and operations roles, um, things like manual orchestration, manual change orchestration specifically, uh, takes time and often leads to employees having to, you know, of course, work overtime during those things. And um, it's also hard to recover from failures manually. So, you know, automation really kind of critical there. And it also takes a long time to document and communicate these changes. And so um, as you see more generative AI being adopted by tools like uh, HWA, you know, that really kind of helps with, with that side of things as well. So we're excited to see the, the continued innovation in, in, in that space. And so... We know that the right solution really helps customers get to that ideal state much faster. And I've spoken about AWS and HCL's partnership a couple of times. So let's look at a couple examples and then you can move to the next slide. Thank you. And so firstly, as the HCL team delivers software to customers via AWS, um, we work with them to ensure that there's you know, mutual customer success there. And as seen on the screen here, uh, this is kind of a snapshot of an architecture we looked at during uh, a workload automation technical review. And so we work with the uh, the workload automation team to ensure that they're you know, building something that aligns with AWS best practices. And also when deploying um, the, the, the product, uh, customers have the option to use native AWS services like Amazon EKS. Mm -hmm. 
And so EKS provides a managed Kubernetes service where you know it really kind of takes care of the heavy lifting of running Kubernetes clusters. And this reduces management overhead for customers so they can you know, spend time on the things that really matter to them, uh, which in this case would be automation, uh, but not necessarily having to manage the automation product you know, behind the scenes. And so next we'll look at the AWS Marketplace. And so what the AWS Marketplace is, is AWS's digital um, catalog that makes it easy to find, test, buy, and deploy third-party software. And so it heavily simplifies the procurement process and provides customers with really a myriad of features to make software management easier. And in May of 2022, um, the AWS Marketplace commis commissioned the total economic impact of using the Marketplace study. And this was conducted by Forrester. And the numbers from the study shows why customers choose to procure via the Marketplace. And so as you see on the slide here, uh, customers see a three quarter reduction in software onboarding effort, um, almost two thirds time saved during software procurement and increased license flexibility. And so this naturally leads to reduction in licensing costs and ultimately an improved ROI uh, for customers. And so if you want more information on this, um, you know, this blog is easy to find using your, your favorite uh, search engine. Um, but you might be asking why, why uh, cover you know, Marketplace in the context of HWA. And so on the next slide here, um, you'll see that customers can procure um, the, the, the product via the AWS Marketplace today. And so this really accelerates the time that it takes to get software into production. Uh, and this is especially powerful for customers maybe moving from on-premises versions um, to cloud-based versions and doing so via the AWS Marketplace uh, customers can be sure that they're utilizing a product that's been, you know, reviewed by AWS and uh, using also software that has a philosophy of natively integrating with the services that customers use uh, where they use it. And so I'll close out uh, on the next slide here with that initial quote um, from Werner Vogel saying everything fails all the time. And so automation is really critical to help helping this um, reality. But I've always kind of wanted my my own quote, so I'm gonna I'm gonna write it write on this and give it my own spin, um, and that is you know automate everything. Now, of course, absolutely everything can't be automated. We definitely need to automate the right things. And uh, as you see here, I'm not the CTO, so I'm not sure how uh, far this quote will will ride. Uh, but we'll we'll give it a go. Um, so we need we know that things fail, and automation is critical for those failures and recovery. But really, the data shows that automation needs to be a primary focus of you know kind of everything we do, both the the critical and the routine stuff. And I've personally you know seen that having the right partner by your side um, really gets you there much faster. And HL Software has been a, a really excellent partner for us to to work with. And uh, yeah, I think you know we're we're kind of here to help elevate customers' um, automation footprint. It's something that we're really passionate about. Uh, so we're absolutely here to, here to help. So please reach out, uh, whether directly after the webinar uh, or by the AWS Marketplace listing. So thank you for your time. And back to you, Alexandra. Thank you, Eugene. I, I love your quote. So in, indeed, our mantra uh, for our HCL automation orchestration uh, offering is uh, automate anything, run anywhere. When, Anywhere, So this is really to run any kind of workload everywhere uh, from the mainframe to uh, to cloud, right, to Kubernetes, and uh, obviously where possible on AWS uh, cloud. So there are uh, a few words uh, on uh, our automation orchestration suite. Uh, so we've been talking about, um, so generally about capabilities. Uh, I wanted to spend a minute about what we offer exactly. So what we offer is uh, uh, a solution that uh, contains uh, say two type of uh, um, two type of uh, uh, engines. Uh, actually, I, I could say three because we have also workload automation that run on the mainframe, uh, which obviously offers specialized capabilities for mainframe environment for the customers who choose to to stay on the mainframe and to exploit at the best that platform for their critical workloads and connect it into uh, their the digital initiatives. So it obviously 
it, uh, it helps to run the workload anywhere from the mainframe. Uh, the, the key offering, um, let's say we, uh, we started with in particular, so was workload automation. That's the, the super scalable, uh, super uh, rich architecture that is uh, uh, SAP certified that is uh, integrated into the AWS marketplace mm -hmm. and that uh, provides really um, uh, easy access to uh, operation users uh, uh, and tap into hundreds of integrations. What you see on the right, the universal orchestrator, this is our newborn cloud native orchestration uh, solution that is completely microservices uh, built. This is the evolution of uh, workload automation that is uh, uh, really born for the new use cases in the cloud and helping to expand also these use cases and the democratization of uh, automation to uh, new business technologist users. Uh, so it, the, the two engines work with uh, the same uh, uh, intelligent uh, layers and, um, and integrations. So the low-code uh, no -code integrations are compatible with the engines. So that allow customers also to to start maybe uh, even from uh, um, as I was mentioning before some uh, uh, replacements of traditional workload automation to the workload automation platform and eventually e expanding also having uh, the combination of uh, use cases in the cloud for the universal orchestrator to to create really that powerful platform uh, to orchestrate any type of workload. If we uh, go to the next charts, I'd like to spend a minute on uh, the automation hub. Uh, what we call the automation hub, so is uh, our internal marketplace. So nothing to compare with AWS marketplace, uh, obviously, but it, it is a, a specific, um, so it is a website actually public. You can go and, uh, and explore automation hub integration with uh, all this local no code integration. What we provide here as a part of the, the product license, so there are no additional costs, we provide for the customer the possibility to build those uh, uh, automation use cases easily without scripting. It's really leveraging uh, uh, predefined, uh, this predefined integration, pre um, uh, form, let's say to specify the um, the specific capabilities, uh, a specific level of integration you want to do either with uh, your robotic process automation uh, solution, so to execute bot, uh, to trigger the bot activity and get the, the, the results uh, back into um, the, the process so that you can kick off another part of uh, the process. Uh, file transfer, as I was mentioning before, we have uh, not only uh, the managed file transfer uh, capability, so native uh, file transfer uh, agent to agent capabilities, but also we integrate with the uh, many market offering, uh, so that uh, like Axway, Sterling, so that we help clients um, really to um, to orchestrate uh, orchestrate uh, the execute the the transfer of files uh, between their an ecosystem of uh, partners and uh, really streamlining their their processes um working with the data and databases uh, etl big data integration this is uh, really a type of use case that is uh, uh, fundamental very much adopted by customers one of the recent integration we did last year was uh, with Snowflake, uh, which is um, very much popular uh, for customers, uh, in particular in their cloud transformation. Uh, and I would mention maybe some uh, uh, mention again. So SAP as a, a big partner for us and uh, really uh, a, a deep integration that we have here to help clients uh, in entering really into the, the process chain execution, into uh, really the making the SAP and non-SAP jobs uh, executing uh, um, uh, together against those uh, SLA and uh, understanding failure and recovering from failure fast. 
IT service management and uh, cloud resources. I think this is the other dimension as um, Dan uh, was mentioning at, at the beginning that are important. So the possibility to integrate new form of solutions. So uh, yes, our portfolio have been evolving from traditional workload automation, offering event driven and batch scheduling for uh, many years but it's evolving more and more into new type of use cases to address better cloud transformation scenarios, uh, to address uh, better data pipeline orchestration type of scenarios, and to expand more and more into the business applications and creating those self-service automation that are important for the business to be able to simplify their access and uh, generation of automation so that they can automate their jobs, uh, their, uh, their workload processes faster. The vertical dimension, maybe you need uh, to, to click one time then. Uh, there should be, uh, yes. Uh, how to boost really uh, an efficient process orchestration in our opinion is to apply well the right AI technologies for specific outcomes and specific uh, users so that operation can benefit from machine learning uh, patterns uh, analysis or anomaly detection so that it can benefit from the predictive uh, SLA control so that critical jobs can uh, uh, be executed on, on time or anything that put at risk the SLA is uh, on the attention of uh, of uh, the operation team and the, the self-service catalog and Clara, I think we, we had some uh, highlights on this one. So um, this come, uh, let's say to, uh, to an end, I think for our, uh, for our session, uh, the last chart uh, gives you access to um, a QR code where you can uh, uh, so uh, click and uh, and connect to our web page and get some uh, um, maybe some more information and get connected with us. Um, I would leave a rally, maybe concluding the call and giving some highlights. Great, thank you, Alexandra. And I wanted to thank our audience for taking time out of your schedule to join us today. You will be receiving a follow-up email from EMA that will include the on-demand playback as well as additional resources from HCL Software. So I hope you'll check that email out and I hope we'll see you at a future EMA research webinar. Thank you again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you everyone. You're welcome.